Hello, and thank you for tuning in to this lecture on electrophysiology modeling sponsored by the Virtual Physiological Rat Project, or VPR. The VPR is supported by a grant from the NIH, uh, National Institute of General Medical Sciences. You can find out more about the VPR by visiting this URL, virtualrat.org. Uh, the examples in this lecture are drawn uh, from this textbook, which you can find out more about from this URL. And in fact, all of the computer codes associated with these examples are distributed at this URL, cambridge.org slash biosim. Uh, these computer codes are implemented in the MATLAB computing environment. You can find out more about MATLAB uh, from the MathWorks company at mathworks.com. Okay, we're going to study uh, this paper, uh, which is a foundational um, a paper in the field um, published in 1952 by Hodgkin and Huxley. So this, this paper, a quantitative description of membrane current and its application to conduction and excitation in nerve, was actually the culmination of a series of papers published by this group in 1952. Um, what Hodgkin and Huxley were interested in, well a lot of folks I suppose were interested in at the time, was understanding the biophysical basis of the excitability of nerves and the propagation of the action potential along the nerve. So we're going to we're going to go through um, um, Hodgkin and Huxley's model and analysis of their data associated with the ex action potential. And I'll, we'll see what we mean by action potential. We're not going to look at propagation of the action potential along the nerves. That could be the subject of a, of a lecture at another time. So, But first, a few uh, basic concepts from electrophysiology. So <coughs> in uh, Hodgkin and Huxley were primarily interested in transport of two positively charged ions, sodium and potassium, and across the um, membrane. And they had reason to believe that these were the primary ions responsible for the um, electrophysiological properties of, of the nerve. Um, here I'm showing, I'm illustrating the cell membrane, and I'm illustrating the typical concentration gradient of potassium ions where there are many much higher concentration of potassium on the inside of the cell than on the outside of the cell. So there is a concentration gradient driving potassium outside of the cell. However, typically the inside of the cell is at a negative electrostatic potential compared to the outside of the cell. So there's a, there's a membrane potential difference which is negative by convention measured as the inside potential minus the outside potential. So that negative potential is associated with an electrostatic gradient which is driving positively charged potassium ions into the cell. Okay. So the free energy change due to the concentration gradient you can compute from this equation here. So this is a standard equation from um, chemical thermodynamics and the free energy change associated with moving an ion from the outside to the inside is um, negative RT times the log of the outside concentration over the inside concentration. Okay, so that means if the inside concentration is higher than the outside concentration, this this free energy change is positive, and that means that there's a pot. It takes a positive input of energy in order to overcome the free energy barrier to move um, an ion from the um, across its against its concentration gradient from the outside of the cell to the inside of the cell. There's also a free energy change due to the electrical potential. Okay, and um, the convention is, like I said, the convention is that electrical potential delta psi is measured inside potential minus outside potential. So if delta psi is negative, that means that the free energy change to associated with moving a positive ion from the outside to the inside is negative. So that means that the electrostatic potential, if negative, is driving positive ions to the inside of the cell. So this F here is called Faraday's constant and it's an important constant. It's actually no, it's, it's nothing more than a unit conversion factor here, okay, because typically in, in, in chemistry and in electrochemistry we measure free energy changes in units of joules per mole. We usually measure voltages in units of joules per coulomb and what this F term allows us to do is convert volts for, in uh, joules per coulomb to um, voltage measured in joules per mole. Okay, so um, if in equilibrium, now 
when there's no net movement of potassium ions from one, one side to the other, that happens when the diffusional gradient is in balance with the electrostatic gradient. And that would mean that if you were to sum these two free energy changes, you get zero. Okay, so the net free energy change for transport across the, across the um, cell membrane is zero, and that happens when F delta psi is equal to RT log outside concentration divided by inside concentration. So that is, um, actually we call that um, membrane potential, the Nernst equilibrium potential for a particular ion. So the Nernst equilibrium potential for potassium ion, um, plugging in typical numbers, we get about minus 80 millivolts. So RT over F, um, it's, a, it, it's a good, um, it's, it's worth kind of keeping that number somewhere at your fingertips. RT over F and, and physiological temperature works out to be about 25 millivolts and then um, the outside concentration of potassium ions, um, typically about five millimolar. The intracellular concentration of potassium ions, typically about 140 millimolar. And so, you know, this is this number is about one. You know, you can work it out about one over um, uh, 28. It's a negative. So the log of a number less than one is negative. So 25 millivolts times that negative number works out to be about minus 80 millivolts. So that means that if the um, membrane potential were minus 80 and the concentration gradient were 5 to 140, then the electrostatic gradient and the, and the, and the concentration gradient driving transport would be in balance and there would be no net passive movement of potassium ions in either direction if there were a channel or some kind of a, a, a pore or a pathway which potassium ions can passively permeate from one side of this membrane to the other. Okay. Now some more basic concepts. What do we mean by an action potential? So this is a, a diagram which I got from uh, Wikipedia uh, source here. Um, typical uh, a, a typical resting potential for a cell so that means if you don't stimulate a, a nerve fiber or you know actually many other kinds of excitable cells they tend to have an, a membrane potential of about minus 70 millivolts and that membrane potential happens to be and we'll see why fairly close to the uh, Nernst equilibrium potential for potassium but what happens is following some kind of stimulus if you can depolarize the membrane a little bit then on its own, the cell, could, the cell will rapidly depolarize, um, increase the membrane potential uh, until it reaches some peak, and then it will recover back down towards the resting potential, usually with, with, with some kind of undershoot. Okay, and this undershoot actually is going to bring you close to the potassium nerves potential, and then eventually recover just to that resting potential. Okay, so this is called an action potential. And, and what are the, what are the um, processes that are going on and what are control, controlling those processes um, that are responsible for this action potential? That is the um, subject of this lecture and that's the subject of this uh, primary subject of uh, studies, early studies by Hodgkin and Oxley. So um, you remember we just talked about the nurse potential for potassium. The nurse potential for potassium is about minus 80 millivolts. Uh, the other important ion in Hodgkin-Huxley's work and in the Hodgkin-Huxley model is sodium. And sodium is another um, positively charged cation. The concentration gradient for sodium is in the opposite direction. It's maintained to be in the opposite direction of this concentration gradient for potassium. And the nurse potential for sodium is about plus 55 millivolts. Okay, so what does that mean? So I'm going to kind of work through this um, uh, th these definitions a little bit more and some of these side conventions to make sure that you can hammer them home um, and understand what what may be going on in, in this kind of action potential before we actually get to Hodgkin Huxley's experiments and, and, and their analysis. So we're going to consider the case of where the um, we have a cell and the inside potential is at minus 70 millivolts compared to the outside. Okay, so this is the resting state. Okay, and the Potassium ion gradient is about 5 on the outside to 140 on the inside. The sodium has, is, is um, about 140 on the outside and 15 on the inside. Okay, so 
we can think of this Nernst potential a couple of ways. One way we can think about this is it is the potential at which um, there's no passive transport of, of that particular ion across the membrane. So we can see that at rest, the Nernst, the, the, um, the resting potential above minus 70 is actually close to the resting potential of the Nernst potential of potassium, but they're not exactly equal. So conve by convention, we, we um, call an inward current a positive current. And so if we define a potassium current, okay, as the um, as the rate at which potassium ions are moving into the cell under some conditions, okay, we can define conductivity for potassium as the current divided by the driving force, okay, or equivalently the current is a conductivity times the driving force. Okay, and the driving force has two components. It, ha it has the, the, the one of the components of the driving force is the membrane potential, the potential across the cell, and it comes in with a minus sign because we're um, talking about um, positive ion, positive ions, and we're defining the inward current as positive. So if the potential is minus 70, the contribution from the membrane potential is positive, so it should be plus 70. The Nernst potential is um, another way to think about the Nernst potential is the concentration gradient term for the, for, of the thermodynamic driving force in units of um, of millivolts or volts. So we've simply taken the um, the the free energy the free energy change associated with the concentration gradient divided by this uh, f, which is this unit converter, and we get minus 80 millivolts. So um, under resting conditions, the um, if we plug in minus 80 minus minus 70, we get that the potassium current, the driving force for potassium current is about minus 10 millivolts, okay? And, um, and the potassium current would be some conductivity times minus 10 millivolts, okay? And that's uh, because the concentration so potassium, the, the, the net driving force for potassium would be actually the outward, which is why this, this potassium current would have a minus sign here, it would be negative, okay? And it's outward because the term associated with the concentration gradient, which is the Nernst potential, is minus 80, and that can overcome the membrane potential, which is minus 70, okay? And when the, if the membrane potential were minus 80, then there would be no driving force, and this term would be zero, okay? So for sodium, um, we have the same kind of equation, except that the concentration gradient and the membrane potential are both working in the same direction. So the Nernst potential for sodium plus 55 millivolts is associated with this, this concentration gradient of about plus 55 millivolts in, in units of, volt, of millivolts, um, minus minus 70. So, the, so sodium really wants to move in um, with a very high inward driving force con compared to under resting conditions potassium which which has an outward driving force of only about minus of about minus 10 millivolts okay so it's going to turn out that actually this depolarization phase is due to a rapid influx of sodium into the cell and this repolarization phase is due to potassium coming back in and um, I'm sorry potassium going out and um, repolarizing the membrane towards the um, Nernst potential for potassium. We'll see that as we go forward. So the main thing to keep in mind is some of these sign conventions, which we're going to um, reinforce as we go forward. So, so um, here we have an illustration of uh, the first set of data which are analyzed in that um, classic 1952 paper by Hodgkin and Huxley. So what we're plotting here are measured potassium conductance as a function of time following an experiment where they clamp the voltage across the membrane potential. Okay. And you have to understand, first of all, that all of the voltages in Hodgkin-Huxley's analysis and in the model equations we're going to work through are defined as V membrane potential minus resting membrane potential. Okay. And so their resting membrane potential under their conditions was not minus 70, but in these um, axons, which were bathed in cold seawater, um, the resting membrane potential was about minus 60, okay? 
So, um, it, for example, in this experiment, the membrane potential was rapidly increased from rest of about minus 60, which in units of V was zero, to 109. Okay. So that means that the membrane potential went to, in delta psi, went from minus 60 to 49. Okay. And then similar, similarly in this experiment, the membrane potential went from V equals 0 to V equals 6, or delta psi equals minus 60 to minus 54. Okay. And what they observed was a increase and then a leveling off in the potassium conductivity. Okay, potassium conductivity uh, in, is defined by this equation we just saw, okay, where the, the potassium current, which they measured, is um, proportional to the membrane potential minus the nurse potential. So this is the same equation we just saw, except just for the sake of making life complicated, we've, we've switched the order of these terms and put a negative sign out front. Okay, and in units of V, this little v, we can subtract our resting potential from our membrane potential and subtract the resting potential from the nurse potential, and we have a we have a nurse potential for potassium, which is measured now relative to the resting potential, um, and and that was about in in Hodgkin Huxley's experiments was about minus twelve millivolts. Okay. Okay. So one other thing you need to know, I think is it, it's important, is how do they measure this potassium conductance? Well, they measure the potassium conductance by measuring potassium current. How do you measure the potassium current? So in these experiments, they actually replaced sodium in the bath by choline, and the choline um, doesn't, it can't go through whatever kinds of pathways or channels or pores that, that the sodium ion can go through. And Hodgkin and Huxley had reason to believe from a lot of prior work of theirs and prior work of others that um, the sodium current, the important sodium current, was inward. And therefore, if they could replace the sodium in the bath with something else, and they measured the current, then they would be measuring only the outward potassium current. Okay? So the um, so when they measure the current and then they, they correct for um, the driving force, they can put this in units of conductance, and what happens in these experiments is, like I said, in response to different clamped voltages, we get a different kinds of transients. And the higher the voltage, the higher the um, conductance. Okay. And so they proposed a differential equation to explain these kinetics, and this is the differential equation that they proposed. In very simple terms, they assume that there's some kind of a, um, a a variable n, okay, which uh, tells us about the probability of the ch of a channel for potassium being opened or closed, okay, and um, so this differential equation for n has a an opening rate, okay, alpha n, and the rate of opening is the opening rate times one minus n, where n is the is the fraction of gates that are closed, a fraction of gates that are open, so one minus n is the fraction of gates that are closed. And then the closing rate is the is closing rate constant beta n times times this open probability. Okay? Now this equation, um, if alpha n and beta n are constants at some given voltage, then this equation is a simple, would give you a simple exponential. Okay? And we can see, as can actually could see that their data did not follow exponential kinetics. And so they assume that the conductivity actually is proportional to some constant conductivity times the open probability to the fourth. Okay, and they were able to get a nice match between the data in that case. All right, so that's a clever thing they did. Um, so the, the um, assuming that for each of these experiments, again, alpha n and beta n are um, constant at a given voltage, then the solution to this equation is a simple exponential with a time constant tau n. That time constant is 1 over the sum of these rate constants. Okay, And the n infinity, or the steady state value that you get, you can just get by setting this dn dt equal to 0 and then doing a little bit of arithmetic and you can get here. So um, from the data, what Hodgkin-Huxley did is they estimated 
tau n, the time constant, okay, and they estimated n infinity, okay, um, given some constant um, maximum conductivity g bar, so okay, okay, and then they went back and from the estimated n infinity and tau infinity, they can estimate alpha n and beta n at each voltage. Okay, so here are uh, here's a table for associated with this particular set of experiments on one particular axon. Okay, so at a, a depolarization of six millivolts, um, they can estimate n infinity and tau n and alpha n in units of per millisecond and beta n in units of per millisecond. Okay, and then presumably these these equations will match these data. Okay, so let's look at our code. Okay, so in order to simulate those experiments, we need a um, file which is going to compute this differential equation. Okay, and that's exactly what this file does: is dxdt sub n, which is the dxdt for the state variable for the for the n gate for the potassium current. And um, what this equation does is it takes as arguments alpha n and beta n, okay, and it then um, computes the right hand side of this differential equation. It's going to allow us to integrate this differential equation given some initial condition, okay. And so now this code here, what I'm doing is I just simply, first of all, for those. Um, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 data sets here from the Hoskin Huxley paper. We're just inputting those, those data in these vectors for um, time versus open probability, or I'm uh, sorry, conductivity. Okay. And now for each one of those experiments, I am taking my alpha n and beta sub n from the table from Hodgkin and Huxley, okay, and creating a, a plotting axis, okay, but the main thing here is integrating that differential equation using an ODE integrator, ODE 1 pi best, that's from MATLAB, um, integrating for 100 milliseconds, okay, why 100 milliseconds? Um, I don't know, we don't need to integrate for 100 milliseconds because we only need to plot it over a much shorter range, but that's what we're doing. Um, and um, then taking the estimated conductivity to be our state variable, which is n raised to the fourth power, times our uh, maximum conductivity, which is reported by Hodgkin Huxley for that particular set of experiments to be 24. And then all the rest of these things are just plotting. Um, and we're doing the same thing. So, so at, at voltage equals depolarization equals 10, we have an alpha n of 0 0.095 and a beta n of 0 0.096. So you can see from this table, 0 0.095 and 0 0.096. Okay. So let's just see what happens when we run this code. Okay. We get the same kind of result that they get. So it works. And so for each one of these depolarizations, we see a little deviation here compared to what they have here, which I think you know has to do with um, having a slightly different value for the um, um, estimated conductivity, maximum conductivity. But basically, we get the same result by plugging the values from their table. Um, and um, so this is for one set of experiments on one particular axon. And so, we, so what Hodgkin Huxley was able to do is they were to tabulate estimates of alpha n and beta n for each one of those at each voltage and do it for several axons, okay? And those are, these are those data. And what they found out, what they determined was that um, the opening rate, okay, increases, okay, as the rate of depolarization increases and the closing rate decreases, okay? So this, this, this alpha and beta trends explain why at higher depolarizations you get much more opening okay and then from alpha and n values you can also compute what the um, steady state open probability is at any particular voltage and so you can see that 
we go to at higher and higher depolarizations, the open probability goes up. Okay. Now if you look at Hodgkin and Huxley's paper, okay, you see these plots, okay, because what Hodgkin and Huxley um, do is um, they actually just to make life confusing is change the sign convention when they're talking about depolarizations. So they plot, um, they have this V. Um, so, so, in Hodgkin, so if you read the Hodgkin Huxley paper, um, you might just, just you don't want to get confused. When they say minus 10 millivolts, it's the same thing as what we mean. Is minus 110 millivolts is plus 110 millivolts in, in this lecture. Okay. So they see the same plots, but just with this x axis reversed. Okay. Okay, and then in order to build a predictive model for um, DNDT in the rate of change of potassium conductivity as a function of voltage, what they did is they just fit lines to alpha and in beta and fit some nice uh, phenomenological curves that go through the data. And these are the these are the functions that they used. Okay, so these functions and, and the units here are in are in um, millivolts. And, per, and, and then these um, multipliers are in um, uh, per millisecond. So we get alpha and beta in, in, in the right units. And um, so these functions are just some functions that they chose which go through the data. Okay. So that's nice. And then n infinity or, or steady state n you can just get from this equation and it works like that. Okay. So far. So next set of experiments. Well, was aimed at characterizing the sodium conductivity in the same way. And the sodium conductivity is a little bit more difficult to characterize um, because you cannot, because if you remember in the potassium, in order to characterize the potassium conductivity, they want to get rid of the inward sodium current. The way they got rid of the inward sodium current was replace sodium in the bath by choline. So if you want to characterize the sodium current, what you'd like to be able to do is rep is, is get rid of the outward potassium current, but there's no straightforward way to replace the potassium in the cell with something else like choline. So what they did was, was to um, do experiments with and without choline and simply subtract the difference, the potassium component, and the measured current they got left they assumed was sodium, and then they convert to the, the, the sodium conductance to conductivity the same way they did with, with potassium. Now, a complicating factor is that with and without um, choline in the bath, there's, they had a slightly different resting potential, and they had to do some interpolation, and it gets a little bit complicated, and you can read about those details in the paper. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to take their data at face value here, um, measure changes in sodium conductivity as a function of time following different depolarizations, and these depolarizations are the same uh, values of depolarization that they used in the potassium experiment. So this is a depolarization of 6 millivolts. This is a depolarization of uh, 100, I think it's 109. Let's go back and check. Yeah, 109. So for depolarization A, it's 109. Depolarization L, it's 6 millivolts. And uh, all the same ones in between. Now the other complicating thing with sodium is it doesn't just go up and go down and, and stay up like potassium did. The sodium conductivity in response to a depolarization goes up and then recovers back down towards zero. So in order to capture these kinetics, they proposed two gates, an M gate, it's called an M gate and an H gate. Okay. And the M gate was assumed to open rapidly with the same kinds of kinetics as we saw for the um, uh, end gate for the, for the potassium current, and the H gate has the same kind of kinetics, but the H gate is going to close and close more slowly. Okay, so same kind of equations. Um, M, uh, it ha if alpha M and beta M are constant at a given voltage, okay, then it has an exponential response like this. If alpha H and beta H are constant, it has an exponential response like this, okay. And from the data, they estimated the m infinity in the tau sub m and the h infinity in the tau sub h. Okay, and they're able to convert those um, m infinity and tau m to estimate values of alpha sub m and beta sub m and alpha sub h and beta sub h for 
each depolarization for each axon. So here's a table. Okay. Now we have a for the sodium conductivity we have a system of two differential equations. And let's go to our MATLAB code. Um, here we we'll have their data, Hodgkin Huxley data input, once again, same way. And um, the for that for this axon, for that set of experiments, the maximal conductivity reported by Hodgkin Huxley was 70 in the units they reported. Okay. Um, and now our differential equation. Um, ODE file for the M and the H gate has two state variables, M and H, and two equations, okay, the DXDT, DMDT, and the DHDT, okay, and these equations are um, these equations here, okay, and so um, what we're doing here is we're assigning the values of alpha sub M, beta sub M, alpha sub H, and beta sub H at a particular voltage, okay, integrating those differential equations, and then computing the conductivity as the maximal conductivity times variable 1, which is m to the third power, times variable 2, which is h to the 1 power, and plotting the data, and um, plotting the um, computed g. Okay? And we're doing that at each one of these voltages here. Okay, and you can get all these codes from from the um, from the Cambridge website, and I will give you that URL again at the end of this lecture. So let's just see what happens. What do we get? Here is our um, simulation of this experiment of Hodgkin and Huxley's using Hodgkin and Huxley model equations for the M and the H gate, and the estimated. Uh, alphas and betas for all, all of these voltages that they report. So we get essentially the same result they get, which is very nice. Okay, and um, going through the same kind of process uh, that they went through for the potassium current, they can then plot the estimated betas and alphas for this M gate and this H gate. And so the, the M gate um, qualitatively follows the same kind of trend as the potassium end gate. Okay, that is that as the level of depolarization increases, the opening probability increases. Okay, and the steady state value tends to go up to be all at, at high depolarizations. Um, the end gate is always open. Now it's interesting to look at the actual values here. Okay, so the values of, of um, beta, um, let's say at a depolarization of 60 is about 4 Per millisecond, the value of alpha, sorry, at alpha sub m at a depolarization of 60 is about 4 per millisecond. And going back to for our um, N gate at a depolarization of 60, it's about 0.4 per, 0.4 per millisecond. So the M gate follows the same kind of kinetics, rough, very roughly speaking, as the N gate, but 10 times faster. Okay. The H gate now is doing the opposite thing. So the H infinity or steady state H value, H is closed when the tends to be closed when the cell becomes depolarized. Okay? And that's because beta sub H, the closing rate, increases with the depolarization, and the um, opening probability decreases with, with depolarization. So this this rev this reverse kinetics of the M gate and the H gate are responsible for the sodium conductivity turning on and then turning off. And because the M gate opens quickly and the H gate closes slowly, we get a transient transient opening or transient increase in conductivity, and then and then a decay. Okay. Now just to remind you, again, Hodgkin Huxley reversed their. Um, have a, have a different sign convention for depolarizations. Um, so they uh, so all of their x-axes for these plots they look just like ours here, except the x-axes are reversed. Okay. Now um, and so for the sodium M gate and for the H gate they did the same kind of thing. They applied the same kind of fitting functions to try to reproduce the trends in the data, and uh, these are the functions they chose. And so these functions look very much the same 
uh, with just different numbers put in here for the M gate and the N gate and then the H gate um, we have of course we have to capture the opposite behavior with beta increasing and alpha decreasing with increasing voltage okay so let's put it all together into the so-called Hodgkin and Huxley model. Hodgkin Huxley model is based on um, this equivalent circuit or an equivalent circuit, something like this, for to capture the behavior of a cell. So the cell membrane is treated in the Hodgkin Huxley model as a capacitor. Okay. And um, the capacitor has some voltage across it, which is the cell membrane potential. And we're going to we're going to use the um, we're going to do our simulations with this V, which is membrane potential inside minus outside relative to rest of potential. Okay. Now each of these currents now is determined by the potential across the cell membrane and by this battery, which is the Nernst potential, which is determined by the concentration gradient. So we have, a, so just like we've seen, we have two driving forces. We have an electrostatic potential across the membrane, which is the potential across this capacitor, and we have a driving force, which is concentration gradient barrier, concentration gradient battery, that is. And we have a variable conductivity, which is our um, determined by our um, gating kinetics for of our N, M, and our H gate for sodium and for potassium. Okay, and we also might have other currents, like an applied current, okay, which might be externally applied, and I'm not showing here, but in the Hodgkin-Huxley model, we have a leak current. And the leak current is a constant conductivity times um, a driving force for leak, which also does not depend on um, any particular concentration gradient. Um, well, it depends on, a, on, an, on an empirically determined uh, leak leak potential and um, the membrane potential, but there are no gating kinetics associated with the leak current. Okay. So in this picture, I'm illustrating the fact that if the um, uh, sodium um, potential is positive, that is associated with the um, outside sodium concentration being higher than the inside, Okay, then that's going to drive current in the forward direction. Okay, if the we know that the um, uh, resting potential associated with potassium, the Nernst potential associated with potassium tends to be negative. So this is actually, uh, you know, I'm drawing the I'm drawing this battery with a sign convention. But if this value is negative, then this is actually going to drive current in the opposite direction outside. Okay, so that's captured by these equations here. So we have some capacitance value for the cell membrane, and then dVdt times the capacitance is equal to sum of all the currents in this electrical circuit. And those currents are conductivity times the driving force. And for the potassium gate, for the potassium current, it's it's n to the fourth, this n gate to the fourth power times um, the maximum conductivity. And the sodium conductivity is this constant. Um, uh, maximum conductivity times the M gate cubed times the H gate times the driving force for sodium. There's this leak current at where VL and G bar leak are parameters of the model. And then there's an applied current, which is how much current is being applied in an in, in experiment. And then we have the three equations for the gating variables. And of course, these alphas and betas are all functions of V according to the empirical relationships that Hodgkin Huxley determined. So this is the Hodgkin Huxley model. It's got four state variables, and we can make that go away, and we can look at our code for the Hodgkin-Huxley model, okay? And this is a little bit more complicated than the codes we've looked at before because we have to capture a lot more information. So we have some parameters in the model, okay? So the parameters are the resting potentials, okay? The resting potential for sodium, you remember that um, we're measuring these potentials relative to the resting membrane potential. So um, a resting potential for potassium of minus 12 millivolts relative to the resting potential of minus 60 is actually a resting is actually minus 72. Um, the leak uh, uh, resting potential 
is about 10 millivolts. Sodium resting potential is about 115. Um, these are the maximum conductivities, which are determined by Hodgkin and Huxley for their overall model behavior. This is memory capacitance. These are our four state variables, the voltage, the M, the N, and the H gate. And then all of our alphas and betas now are computed as functions of the um, voltage according to the equations that we've seen already. So for example, if we want to look at one of them, alpha H is 0 0.7 e to the minus V over 20 in units of millivolts. Alpha H, 0 0.7 times e to the minus V over 20. Okay. Then all these currents we compute according to for example, the potassium current is minus GK times N to the fourth times the driving force. Uh, GK times N to the fourth times the driving force. Okay, And then these derivatives for the four state variables are these right-hand side of these four equations here. Okay. And then what this does, I am also have, have an extra output argument, which is actually the, the computed conductivity. So we can also grab those computed variables and plot those as well as the state variables in the model. Okay, So here is what we're doing. So um, this script simulates the Hodgkin-Huxley model with applied current. Okay, So the first thing we do is we, we, we actually run the model to some steady state with an applied current of zero given some arbitrary initial conditions, um, 0, 0, 0, for the four state variables. Okay, and We run it for 30 seconds, and we get an a, um, output which we set to be the initial condition for the simulation we're going to do. And then we have a non-zero applied current. We simulate the Hutchkin Huxley model for 30 seconds. Okay, And here I'm plotting the first state variable, which is the voltage. Okay. And then we're also going to now loop over our output variable x and grab the, those conductivity values. And I'm plotting conductivity, the first conductivity and the second conductivity, which are the sodium and potassium conductivity. So if we run this set of codes, we get indeed these action potentials. Okay, and at this particular value for the um, injected or applied current, we get a continuous train of action potentials. Um, the resting potential is around is zero, okay, by definition here, okay, and the applied potential causes us slight depolarization until we get to some threshold which causes these fast sodium channels to open up, and the sodium current into the cell causes a depol rapid depolarization, and then um, what happens is the sodium, potential, sodium channels start to close, okay, and the potassium now goes out, okay, because with the much slower kinetic potassium channels tend to open, and when the potassium channels are, tend to have a very high conductivity, we move down towards a nurse potential for potassium, okay, and then when the potassium currents close, you know, we get closer. The leak current, you know, turns on, and we get closer to the resting potential. So, I think that the um, if we were to zoom in, for example, we would expect this voltage to approach minus 12. Okay, so it gets, yeah, maybe minus 11 almost. Okay, which is, if you remember, minus 12 is our um, nurse potential for potassium. Okay, it doesn't quite get to 12 before the conductivity starts to turn off and it starts to repolarize due to injected current and, and leak. So again, all these codes are available. Um, that uh, is the Hodgkin Huxley model in a nutshell. Okay, I really encourage you to look at this paper. It's an absolute classic paper from the field. Um, if you if you work in electrophysiology, this should be bread and butter for you. Um, and just as a reminder, you can find out more about the virtual rat from uh, it, from from this URL and the computer codes for this example and all the examples in this book are available free online thank you very much for tuning in